Okay, hello everyone and welcome to this last session of the IEEE Seasonal School on, on Secret and System for IoT. And uh, it is my pleasure today to uh, introduce uh, Vijay Narayanan. Uh, he's a, a professor in uh, the School of ECS at uh, Penn State University. Uh, he's also a fellow of the uh, National Academy of Inventors at IEEE and ACM, and a distinguished lecturer of the IEEE uh, Council of uh, uh, Electronic Design Automation, uh, CEDA. Um, so today uh, he will talk about uh, processing in memory and uh, architectures uh, that are uh, investigated for deep learning and, and graph applications. So. Uh, VJ, the floor is yours. And uh, if you have any questions for uh, VJ, so please uh, send your question directly uh, on the chat box and, and uh, we'll answer that at the end of the presentation. So thank you, VJ. Uh, uh, thank you, Anton, uh, for uh, hosting me. Uh, uh, I wish I were in Bordeaux in person, but all these travel hassles uh, prevent me from uh, coming to visit uh, the wonderful place there. It's been about 10 years since I, I was there. Uh, so good afternoon to everyone joining in from uh, Europe and uh, good times uh, uh, wherever you're joining uh, globally. Oh, just, uh, Vijay, be before starting, I think there is an echo. Uh, so maybe if you're using your phone for, for an initial... Uh... Yeah, is it is it better? Yes, I think it is. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, so. Uh, today's uh, uh, talk is going to be uh, on a specific aspect of machine learning and uh, graph applications that you have been seeing uh, in uh, other uh, keynotes and other sessions in this uh, uh, seasonal school. Uh, so um, uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, how memory plays a key role uh, in this uh, architectures and what can be optimized out there. Uh, it will be semi-tutorial and uh, semi-research uh, uh, progress that we have been doing in my research group. So uh, if you look at what's happening to uh, some of these uh, training models that you see in uh, the deep neural network community, uh, this is actually showing you how the number of parameters in these uh, deep neural networks have been changing. And uh, if you look at uh, one of the uh, latest uh, language modeling processors, uh, GPT-3, it has a whopping 175 billion uh, parameters. And um, so you can see it's a lot of memory uh, in terms of model sizes. And uh, uh, of course, um, it also means when these type of models are, it is also very compute intensive to generate some of these models. So to be able to generate a model with so much memory requirements on any reasonable machine, even with endowed with a lot of memory, it means shuttling down the data from one memory hierarchy to another. And if you look at uh, some of the uh, emerging applications that put together and utilize these neural networks, they basically have many different modules. And sometimes some of these libraries execute better, sometimes on a GPU, sometimes they execute better on a CPU. Uh, they, uh, again, work on different heterogeneous components uh, very well. So if you look at this picture, uh, these are uh, six pipelines put together by uh, Professor Ramesh Govindan uh, at USC, with whom I work in the Connix Research Center. Uh, it basically indicates different modules have been uh, generated to execute on different uh, processes. So when you basically share data across different types of processes, different type of ASICs, 
this accentuates the need to move uh, data. So uh, th that's uh, really makes data movement a critical aspect. And if you look at our traditional way in which you uh, deal with data, uh, data size and the data memory wall is managed using a memory hierarchy. Uh, and this has been the traditional notion. However, when the data volume becomes uh, uh, pretty large and further away from you, the cost of this data movement, cost in terms of time, cost in terms of power consumed, is pretty enormous. So if there is an option that you don't need to move the data, and you could essentially operate on the data that resides in the memory hierarchy, that is what is referred to as processing in memory. So if you uh, look at uh, 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 designs in these uh, uh, cases, uh, the traditional model of general purpose computing, which moves things uh, around to uh, just cache things and utilize in a CPU, does not eliminate the significant overhead. So uh, there have been various means by which uh, researchers have been looking at mitigating the cost of data movement in many of these machine learning uh, applications. And this slide is essentially an overview. So uh, the first uh, on the leftmost uh, corner, if you can see my uh, uh, mouse, refers to once a data is brought into the processor, you leverage parallelism and data flow optimizations in a specific ASIC or FPGA to be able to do this well. Shifting from that type of a traditional viewpoint of accelerators, if we move into leveraging data that's typically stored in a cache and you operate on the cache directly, then that's called as compute and cache architectures. And there have been various approaches uh, like integrating a cache on top of a processor using uh, 3D technology, integrating uh, compute elements in an array architecture uh, in the sub-bank level of uh, SRAM memories. So those have been different techniques. A more recent trend is actually embedding uh, compute into uh, the DRAMs, uh, uh, which is actually adding processor cores into the DRAM. And one of the early efforts uh, uh, with regard to integrating process and DRAMs uh, actually uh, originated from a European company uh, and was in hot chips a couple of years back. But uh, 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 recently this year, even a mainstream provider like Samsung uh, uh, showcased a design which integrated processors uh, at the some bank level. And we'll look at it a little more detail. And again, the goal here is uh, to leverage extensive parallelism by uh, computing on multiple DRAM banks concurrently and also avoiding the data movement from the DRAM to any external memory. Uh, one category of uh, uh, memory that has had a lot of uh, research uh, done has been in the notion of these uh, cross-point memory architectures built off things like resistive RAMs, ferroelectric RAMs, MTJs. So uh, these uh, essentially have served as a, a, a wonderful perimeter for intrinsically computing uh, multiply accumulate that is predominant in uh, machine learning applications. And we'll get to see a lot more about it as well. But when you start thinking about data going into a terabyte regime to be operating on it, then uh, you should really start thinking about uh, storage devices like your NAND flashes or even more. So uh, more recently, compute in 
uh, these uh, storage devices uh, is becoming uh, very interesting. And uh, I'll uh, just refer you to some um, interesting new work emerging uh, in this. So you can really think about these as smart disks. Uh, uh, so let's uh, look at uh, what are issues and why do we need this in-memory compute? What really motivates this in-memory compute? So now let's, uh, for the time being, even forget that moving data across the memory hierarchy is expensive. Moving data within a single level of memory hierarchy in itself is expensive. And what is being shown here is a 2.5 MB uh, uh, cache, uh, L3 cache in this case, uh, which is organized into multiple slices, 14 slices to be precise, as you see. And they are all connected by a ring-like uh, interconnect. And each one of these slices is in turn divided into banks, and those banks further into sub-banks. And eventually, the lowest granularity at which you intrinsically do the read writes is basically a sub-array. And now if you really think about accessing data from a SRAM, and really figure out where is actually the time spent, where is the energy spent, you will realize the effort to move the data from the subarray to the output pins of a cache or a cache module, if it's still integrated within the same chip, is actually the data movement cost even within this single monolithic L3 unit is pretty significant. So now imagine if I am able to integrate compute at the subarray or subbank level, it would mitigate the need for me to traverse across this new kind to connect to through to the IO ports. In addition, if I am able to uh, let's just imagine just the slice level. If I incorporate processing at each one of these slice levels, it starts becoming a massively parallel processor within the SRAM. So that's really the primary motivation for these type of in SRAM compute. One of the uh, uh, approaches, the early approaches that uh, were done was from uh, University of Michigan along with uh, Intel. Uh, called as neural cache. And uh, what they landed up doing is they added logic to the peripheral circuit of these uh, subarrays, which did bitwise Boolean operations. And they also cascaded some of these bitwise Boolean operations to be able to do uh, arithmetic operation like an uh, add operation. And what this enabled, as you can see, the key benefit that's coming in from this modification to an SRAM is if you think about compute happening in these red dots, you basically have a bunch of concurrent operations that you can do in these designs. And the primary basis is essentially reading from these bit lines and uh, uh, doing operations, let's say A plus B, it reads A and B successively into the uh, array and then uh, does this operation. Uh, one uh, issue uh, in this particular type of design is of course you're adding uh, additional peripheral logic for the compute, which is impacting the density. And the other part is you're basically having to charge and discharge these uh, long bit lines for any one of these operations, resulting in uh, some additional uh, energy penalties to access these uh, global lines. There have been uh, other approaches uh, uh, that do this a little differently. So uh, in the neural cache approach, 
it was purely based on like having a more digital compute red a red b did this sequentially here uh, however there was an analog version which basically uh, reads multiple rows at the same time and then you basically have an analog summation of these uh, different values there is work from uh, uh, princeton uh, which uh, landed up doing something uh, similar uh, where they basically do a weighted uh, uh, multiplication of all the bits that are stored across a column. And if you let each one of these cells discharge concurrently by activating multiple word lines at the same time, you would be able to do a multiplication or summation of wi size, which is a basic perimeter in many of these machine learning kernels. In my research group, we have been collaborating with colleagues at uh, NTHU and NDL in Taiwan, building some of these uh, compute elements uh, by stacking additional transistors on top of standard uh, SRAM cells uh, using a technology called as monolithic 3D integration, which allows you to basically have connections between one layer to the other layer in very fine dimensions that make it possible to do this type of interleaving across uh, both layers. In this particular case, we basically added three transistors, which helped us to be able to do multiple logic operations on two different uh, rows of uh, 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 a memory uh, subarray uh, supporting a uh, lot of in-memory uh, Boolean uh, operations that were needed. Uh, there is also a recent work from uh, TSMC, uh, which showed uh, proof of concept of uh, replacing some of the 60 cells that you saw in some of these earlier uh, designs with a more robust 80 cell and also using a uh, multi-pulse width technique for supporting multi-bit uh, inputs in this design. And again, this was an analog design incurring a slightly larger overhead than some of the uh, digital techniques. So that kind of uh, indicates the state of the art uh, on the SRAM. And when I go a little deeper uh, uh, later in the talk, I'll actually show you a completely orthogonal approach that uses compute in memory uh, using uh, lookup tables as the compute perimeter, which is uh, essentially not changing uh, the memory nature of this design. Moving up the stack, if you uh, data becomes a little more uh, larger, we would probably have a DRAM based uh, processing in uh, memory architecture. Uh, again, uh, this is the uh, most recent design that I talked about, which was uh, presented uh, in June in the International Symposium on Computer Architecture by Samsung. What they end up doing, akin to uh, the designs that I showed you, add logic into a, a sub bank of an SRAM. In this case, it's adding a processing in memory unit at each bank of a DRAM die. And the PIM unit blow up is shown out here, which is basically supporting uh, a 16 bit floating point uh, operations, uh, specifically multiply and accumulate. And they also have a provision of uh, local registers for these PIM units to be able to operate on them. And this substantially increases parallelism. It also substantially reduces and mitigates the amount of data transfer. And uh, there has been uh, similar work on uh, supporting uh, of addition of uh, uh, these type of compute units at the bank level. And uh, there's also been work from CMU, which basically uh, does a little more drastic change uh, to the DRAM itself to be able to do bitwise DRAM uh, computations uh, akin to the bitwise uh, SRAM computations uh, that we saw. And of course, uh, the DRAM being uh, a destructive uh, read uh, incurs a refresh cycle after these operations. 
year at uh, Penn State, we have been uh, exploring the addition of a uh, risk five course uh, at uh, different granularities of a, a DRAM chip. And uh, we have also been uh, uh, able to uh, leverage a traditional uh, uh, design uh, approach uh, like uh, the Hadoop framework in uh, trying to uh, distribute uh, some of these uh, applications using the map reduce uh, uh, paradigm. And uh, we have seen a significant uh, uh, speed up on uh, various applications uh, that form the backbone of uh, many of our uh, machine learning applications, primarily because these risk scores are uh, embedded uh, in uh, these uh, DRAM banks are able to do a lot of computations. And these uh, risk score uh, are basically doing a tight knit computation where uh, their instruction set is within a small instruction cache uh, within this design. And uh, one of the things uh, I want to point out because I tried to make this more relevant to a seasonal school rather than just uh, a research intensive talk. For uh, in these slides, you basically notice uh, references, which would provide you a more detailed view uh, of each one of these concepts that I'm basically introducing you uh, right now. And time will permit me to probably go into a, a deeper exposition for maybe one or two of these later. Uh, so moving on, uh, the memory hierarchy stack. Now, if you think about uh, solid uh, state uh, storage uh, flash type designs, uh, this is work from uh, University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign from uh, Professor Di Ming Chen and uh, Wen Mei Hu. Uh, what they'll end up doing is basically add uh, these flash controllers for each and every uh, channel uh, of the design. So they basically have these channel accelerators along with this uh, uh, flash controller, which enables you to do uh, computations uh, very close to where the data is uh, done. And uh, they also have, in addition to these channel accelerators, they have a more powerful accelerator that basically aggregates things uh, uh, around uh, all these channels. And um, so this uh, essentially uh, tries and shows uh, how you would have near SSD uh, compute. And of course, um, for some of you who are familiar with the open SSD platform and uh, Samsung also has some uh, prototypes of those type of designs where you actually have an FPGA on your SSD uh, board. You can really think about this to be uh, uh, more specialized uh, designs. There's also work uh, which is exploring a more uh, a radical approach. The reason I say radical approach, uh, this uh, design essentially thinks about uh, implementing uh, these type of Mac operations within the NAND flash. So now we are not thinking about adding components outside the NAND flash, but we are really thinking about modifying the NAND flash. Of course, uh, this part has a um, lot of uh, challenges because uh, NAND flash currently is driven uh, by densities and our ability to uh, in continue increasing uh, density. So any modifications that bring some compute to these uh, that have uh, implication on density are a, a, a serious compromise of uh, things that are driving uh, its uh, sales right now. So while this work from uh, uh, University of Minnesota did these uh, modifications to a NAND sim, these are still to uh, uh, see uh, commercial uh, acceptance for those type of changes. Another layer of uh, uh, exploration that uh, we are doing here at Penn State uh, at the uh, hard disk level is to actually make very simple changes to uh, the uh, 
FTL software layer uh, so that it's able to run uh, this FTL and manage some of these uh, video indexing for very large videos uh, within the SSD. So we can carry out a lot of filtering operations on a lot of this large volume data that you're trying to do the analytics right within the SSD without having to stream that video data to a host or a external accelerator. And uh, again, uh, this would need to be uh, a complete talk in itself. Uh, uh, so uh, these are just teasers to kind of tell you what are opportunities. And again, one aspect that I would like to emphasize, many of these opportunities are really a combination of hardware software systems uh, that come into play uh, with a good knowledge about the target application that you are uh, trying to optimize. And uh, the last overview aspect that I'm going to provide you is at the level of uh, some of these emerging crossbar arrays, uh, which land up uh, trying to basically store the weights at the cross points and then uh, think about uh, the activations coming in uh, as uh, different rows and summation across the columns essentially provides the MAC operation. And recently, there are uh, commercial offerings of these type of uh, cross point architectures like Mythic uh, that are uh, occurring uh, in real world. So uh, before I uh, um, jump into a detail, uh, uh, depth of two specific uh, applications, one uh, which is a lookup table based uh, design leveraging SRAMs and another one which would basically look at an entirely different type of deep networks based on graph analytics, is there a pressing question that anyone has? Uh, Anton, if you can read any of those questions, that would be helpful if you do get any one. I will continue to take questions at the very end as well. So if I don't get an interruption, I'll assume there are no questions and I'll move on. Okay. If there are questions, please uh, type them. I'm happy to answer them at any point of time. Uh, but let's uh, go deeper uh, into this uh, uh, lookup table based uh, energy efficient cache support. Uh, this is work uh, was done uh, in collaboration with the Intel uh, Bangalore team. Uh, and um, this motivation uh, stem from uh, other aspects that I showed you. So if you start thinking about some of these analog SRAMs, then it needs modifications to the analog to digital converters, which are doing summation from many SRAMs. And the challenge with any analog component for people who have done design, they change the reliability robustness profile, especially with all the uh, PVT variations that are done. And in fact, the neural cache approach uh, done at Michigan, which was also done uh, uh, in collaboration with a different group at Intel, was uh, motivated to use a digital approach because uh, it, it avoided some of the PVT changes, but it still requires uh, changes to the custom layout subarrays. And one of the things uh, that is really tuned in some of these caches for density is uh, actually some of these uh, custom subarrays. And as I mentioned to you even uh, uh, when we were talking about that slide, uh, one of the challenges that happens is uh, when it's trying to do A or B, it's first reading A, then reading B, and each one of these operations basically involve charging and discharging the highly capacitive bit lines in the design. And imagine that it's just not a single bit line that it's reading right now. Uh, you saw those red dots. If you recollect from the previous uh, slide where I showed you this, there were all the subarrays, all the bit lines are charging and discharging, which really makes a typically low power uh, module like a cache to a much higher power module uh, when doing these type of computations. So we wanted to try and see whether there's some 
better way of not having to charge and discharge these bit lines for computation. So our goal was to place compute logic near each subarray without a significant uh, uh, perturbation to the individual subarrays uh, themselves. And we wanted not to add just uh, any of these additional logic next to these subarrays because they are area expensive and energy consuming. And we went in for a lookup table based compute, which is nothing but a reference sheet uh, uh, that can support a bunch of different operations for people who have done Kartic designs uh, with FPGAs. You know how to use Taylor series expansion to do a lot of these trigonometric functions and uh, other Kartic functions, right? So this is really extending this concept uh, out here. And uh, for people not familiar with this, I'll give you a few examples of how to do uh, lookup table uh, uh, type operations uh, after I cover the architecture part of it. So the key to our uh, design is to leave the sub array as is with a very small tinkering, which basically designates a few rows at the very end of each sub array as what we call as the lookup table arrays. And the key difference in this particular case is these lookup table arrays are also just storing data, but it is using da uh, data that is going to be indexed to perform computations as opposed to store data. And we also add an uh, isolation uh, 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 circuit here to kind of uh, make sure whenever we are operating to read this lookup table for performing computations, we do not need to drive the entire subarray bit line, limiting the bit line switch to a much smaller capacitive load. And this is possible in this case because logically the data and the compute part are isolated. This sort of partitioning at the circuit level is not very viable for the neural cache approach because for the neural cache approach, you cannot necessarily isolate some part as compute and some part as data. So uh, that's why this is uh, viable. With this modification in the sub array, outside this uh, uh, sub array partitions, we add a compute uh, engine out here, which is called as the bit line free compute engine because we do not make use of the bit line charge and discharge. That's the reason why it's called as the bit line free compute engine. And the bit line free compute engine is basically a simple three stage pipeline in order core, which lands up intercepting any of these uh, instructions that need to be uh, executor. So rather than actually have uh, instruction come externally from the CPU, access data, return the data to the CPU. Now what we do is we basically prime this BCE to do a sequence of operations. So if the BCE, let's say, needs to do a multiply operation, and let's say it's doing a multiply three times five, what it ends up doing is it, for it indexes a particular row out here, which stores the result of all possible products of three times five, three times seven, three times nine. But of course it supports up to four bit uh, uh, multiplications of each one of these parameters. And the rest of those uh, operations of multiplies that are larger numbers or for even numbers, it basically makes use of uh, inherent shift in this in order code to do the performance. So you can really think about lookup table as a place that pre-stores pre-computed values for a subset of these operations. And then by using other arithmetic properties like shifting and other aspects of it, you would be able to use these pre-computed values for certain operations to do any generic MAC operations. In contrast to this, you could basically store things like logarithmic tables or tan edge tables and then 
just use this parser to index things to get values. And that would be very useful for things like uh, your um, uh, uh, functions uh, that are uh, used for uh, uh, doing uh, things like canH or uh, ReLU type functions that you would use uh, in your uh, neuron implementations. Let's uh, take a, a look at implementing multiplication because MAC operations are uh, predominant in these type of uh, neural networks. So here you can see, as I mentioned, you are basically going to store the results of three times three is nine, three times five is 15, three times seven is 21. As I mentioned here, we basically store only odd numbers. And the reason for storing odd numbers, as I mentioned, is even number computations can be done with numbers out here using shift operation. So if you are doing any multiplication with one operand seven, what happens is the BCE indexes into the lookup table, fetches these values, and then it also knows it's doing seven times 15, then it would basically offset this, index this, get this value. And this is basically showing you the time sequence that it is uh, operating on to get uh, particular uh, operations being done. And uh, you could also do a bunch of them concurrently in all the different LUTs across these uh, subtimes. And uh, this is showing you for four bit operands, you could do uh, multi bits, uh, kind of fusing these things or doing a shift operation. So this is really the basic uh, core concept of this uh, LUT function. And then you can land up doing uh, scheduling operations on these uh, designs so that when you fetch a particular data, and uh, remember the data part of it is within the uh, same cache array. Uh, uh, and uh, you would then traverse uh, the input bit of one of these bit streams to be able to do these matrix multiplication A0, 0 with all the columns, then A01 with the next column. So you basically also have a partial uh, output register within this BCE, which could basically accumulate the results uh, uh, across these uh, designs. And having these type of uh, uh, design flow optimizations uh, it provides you uh, a significant uh, uh, speed up for these uh, uh, computations. Going beyond uh, MAC, MAC uh, uh, operations where uh, uh, the multiply operations were pretty easy for you to do. Uh, here, here is how you would do things like activation functions, stanage or uh, exponential type functions. There you're basically doing some piecewise uh, approximations and you are basically storing these piecewise uh, approximations in the lookup tables, and you are indexing based on the values that you are seeing uh, to implement these things. And of course, uh, these have been extensively used in the context of uh, memory-based implementations of uh, FPGAs. And for that matter, even the multiply operations uh, for people who have been doing FPGA designs, there was uh, um, a very nice, a paper back in early 2000s from Altera on increasing the multiplier capacity in their chips by using block cramps as multipliers. Another key aspect that we uh, did to this uh, architecture was we landed up having a very simple router added to these uh, subarrays that also helped move the data across these uh, subarrays in a uniform pattern. And uh, we leverage these routers to implement some of these matrix multiplication operations using a systolic flow. And again, uh, for people who are aware of systolic flows, uh, one of the early uh, uh, operations that were uh, mapped to systolic arrays was indeed matrix multiplication. But the key, uh, advance that we are uh, performing here is we are using these lookup table based primitive computes that are directly embedded in the caches. The data is now inherently stored in the subarrays. And we introduce these routers that now maps 
traditional matrix multiplication in these uh, cash structures. So uh, you are now able to utilize this memory either to do a convolution mode or a matrix mode by basically articulating how things are stored in the subarrays to begin with and how you move them using these uh, uh, subarrays. Um, so the overall uh, uh, design in this particular case works with the notion you have a CPU that has a large cache and makes sense when you start thinking about a company like Intel, correct? Because they are really still driving a lot of their performance based on CPUs, but they land up using large L3 caches for some of these CPUs. When you need to use this neural network components, what you land up doing is you switch the cache from a normal cache mode to a accelerator mode. You load all these LUT entries into the cache. The rest of the data can be loaded again, or you could reuse some of the data that remained within the CPU based on what your operation is. You configure the instructions to each one of these slice controllers uh, uh, out there. Then the cache and slice controller work with these bit-free compute engines that are massively parallel at each one of these units. And they are able to do not bit serial operations, but they are able to do bit parallel operations in this particular case, unlike the neural cache, because all you're doing is reading an LUT, adding things or whatever. So that is uh, another option that's being done out here. I will not emphasize on the results part because uh, it's the concepts that matter. And you can actually go and read this papers to say the desired impact in terms of performance and energy efficiency was achieved when running uh, different type of uh, uh, networks and uh, varying these networks and varying the precision and then uh, having a different type of memory to which this SRAM uh, interfaces. Is it a DRAM, an embedded DRAM, or an HPM? And one thing that you notice out here, which kind of motivates the other aspects that we say, even though we did a lot of these computes within the SRAM and obviated the need for the SRAM data to move into the CPU, even for this SRAM-based accelerator, the DRAM data movement, the DRAM bandwidths, have a significant role. So you can see the time when we use a much higher bandwidth uh, memory, like an HPM, does still make an important part, which also comes back and motivates the need. Hey, if there is another level of compute in the DRAM, that would also uh, 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 be helpful. And uh, the question of if you have processing in memory at different levels of memory hierarchy, where should it be done is still kind of an open quest. The last uh, uh, few minutes of this uh, talk, I will probably just introduce you to a very recent work, uh, which is going to appear in uh, ICCAD later. But just to give you a flavor, when we start thinking about uh, processing in memory, uh, the type of operations are important and where you do it is important. So I'm basically now going to move from an SRAM to one of these cross point memory architectures and highlight that when you deal with a new workload like a graph convolution neural networks, it impacts the primitives that you need to design. So there is new type of primitive accelerators that you need. And also uh, the application matters a lot. So uh, when you start thinking about graphs, you can basically think graphs are stored in a very simple, uh, a simplistic format, and then you can show a lot of performance improvement. But storing the graphs in the real way that they are stored in a compressed format 
uh, in uh, real world applications and then translating them to success is a totally different thing. So these interactions are what I would kind of tease you in 10 minutes. I may not be able to do everything, but I will at least uh, provide you some insights. But to understand that, let's kind of understand what a graph convolutional neural network essentially means. So in a typical uh, uh, forward pass uh, uh, inference in the neural network, the I plus uh, one layer of feature is derived by some uh, uh, function of the weight matrix and the feature at the ith level plus some bias passed through an activation function. So this works well for structured data such as images and text. When we start thinking about graph data, we not only need to capture uh, the relationship between one layer to the other, we need to capture the correlation between some of these nodes that are represented as edges. So uh, here our computation starts adding a adjacency matrix which correlates the interaction between these uh, nodes. And these uh, adjacency matrix are typically sparse and they come as coordinate lists or uh, uh, in the uh, compressed row format or the compressed uh, column format uh, out here. And the basic operation that we are doing is uh, we are transforming the feature using the uh, adjacency uh, 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 matrix and uh, the features that are aggregated together with a corresponding uh, weight. So let's look at uh, uh, a citation graph. Uh, maybe someone is already doing analysis. He's uh, giving me all this talk. Let's look at some of the references that he made. Then you're going to see some things like these citation uh, graphs. Each node is a paper, gets information of this, the topics that they do, and the task may be to predict the category of uh, unknown paper D just based on the links uh, that uh, exist between these uh, topics. So uh, uh, many of these graph convolutional uh, neural networks are uh, uh, doing some of these citation graphs like uh, things from the medical uh, publication or the data set collab or uh, this Reddit. One of the key things to note in this particular case is the edge, well, edges are uh, 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 features are not as substantial as the node features, right? So in absolute volume. So these are really node centric in terms of the amount of uh, data volume stored in some of these uh, graph uh, convolutional networks. And many of the prior designs that work with CNNs were more edge centric uh, uh, designs kind of making you uh, deal with it. So now if you think about uh, uh, a more uh, simpler example with just uh, uh, four uh, nodes, knowing that uh, you have, in a real design, you have lots and lots of these vertices and edges, uh, while more edges, typically the vertices have a lot more information associated with them. So if you really think about uh, the feature aggregation stage, each node basically has these uh, uh, features you add uh, all these features together from uh, the different nodes, and then uh, the uh, obtained aggregated feature goes through this uh, uh, matrix uh, multiplication uh, to kind of give you a new transform feature. So this is the primitive operation these graph convolutional networks do. But the key aspects here from an efficiency perspective is the sparsity of all these graph operations and the need to store these graphs in compressed format. So when you think about uh, these uh, cross point memory architectures, the MAC operation is typically performed by basically distributing the weights to each and every node. But in an adjacency matrix where a lot of these things are not going to be utilized because they are zeros, it is an inefficient use of your crossbar 
architecture, right? So this is the perimeter that is typically supported. So if everything is in a dense uh, format, then uh, there are going to be a lot of zeros that are present. So this uh, simple Mac operation supported by all these prior approaches is not going to be uh, sufficient. So there were two operations that we added. Uh, one is a ternary uh, uh, cam-like function to search. What is the value so that we can basically uh, compare values and uh, 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 exactly. And then we also had a, a comparison operation which basically told you whether the value was within a certain range. And this operation is really helpful when you start traversing uh, the compressed domain operation. And uh, maybe given that I'm running out of time, this may be a good place for me to kind of fast forward uh, some of the slides, but kind of focus on this aspect. While we knew that this was a primitive, maybe most of you knew this coming in if you have seen any type of uh, uh, machine learning accelerator, but you would be surprised that uh, a very simple modification to the same camps, uh, uh, to the same cross point architecture can also introduce this functionality of uh, providing uh, a cam uh, or an associative memory type match, as well as a range comparator to support uh, some of these operations. And when you add these two types of functionality, it lands up helping you operate on a very new type of uh, sparse graphs that are prevalent in some of these uh, graph neural networks. So uh, for example, in this collab benchmark, uh, our matrix uh, A is 372 by 372 and our feature map is much uh, larger. And uh, A is a large spa sparse matrix uh, and only point one, 0.01%, yes, it's 0.01% uh, of edges are one. So feeding A as input directly to FI is extremely wasteful, right? Because of the zero computes. So what we want to do is transform uh, this opposite, uh, uh, feed in the features uh, uh, to A and uh, do these type of transformations. So typically when you think about uh, uh, the graph representation, you really think about source, node, and weight uh, type representations. And uh, these are how the mappings uh, land up uh, mapping in prior uh, approaches to do these uh, graph analytics. They only supported non-compressed form very effectively. In contrast, uh, the work that we have been exploring opens up the notion of storing some of these uh, features in a compressed sparse row and a compressed sparse column format, necessitating beyond these simple Mac operations. So uh, this is the last uh, uh, idea that I will uh, leave you with, and I will probably share my rest of the slides for you to see uh, the rest of the presentation. But the key thing is, when you think about these graph operations and uh, earlier work where indeed uh, in graph R and gas X, where uh, earlier work, which did a, a great job of mapping some of these graph analytics uh, into uh, these cross point architectures. However, they still don't play the interplay with uh, more effective software representations of these matrices. When you start needing to support these type of things, you would need to redesign your hardware to support some of these uh, uh, SCAM and CCAM structures that I briefly mentioned. And once you have an heterogeneous type of components, you also need to start thinking about data flow and data flow optimizations uh, that are essential. Uh, so, that's where I will stop uh, having provided you some overview of what's happening in the in-memory world and where uh, we are seeing these complex interactions between software, hardware, 
uh, optimized representations, uh, different types of machine learning uh, uh, approaches. They provide a very rich uh, uh, variety of uh, optimizations uh, that we can uh, land up uh, doing. So uh, with that, I basically will conclude my uh, talk and leave you with uh, this uh, talk uh, again. There are a lot of these different uh, compute memory uh, storage uh, hierarchy. So we are no longer in the era where we just have memory hierarchy. We are in an era where we have processor hierarchy, where you have different type of processing embedded at all layers of your memory stack. Where should I operate? What type of processor should I uh, use? How should I manage uh, uh, the programming of these things? This is a real open fertile area for multiple PhDs, multiple graduate uh, uh, student research, uh, a very exciting period in our lives. Uh, thank you, uh, and uh, I'm ready to take questions. Thank you very much, Vijay, for the excellent talk. Um, so please ask your questions in the, in the chat. So I see there are uh, two questions already. Uh, first question is from uh, Juan Pablo Martinez Brito. Uh, oh, thank you for highlighting the question. Um, so we'd like uh, you to comment on, on uh, uh, analog processing in memory and, uh, and maybe describe briefly the, the, the basic principles. Okay, let's... So if you uh, really think about uh, what uh, analog processing in memory does, uh, let's just take the notion of each one of these uh, SRAM cells uh, is containing a zero or a one. And uh, imagine the weight is also a zero or a one uh, for simplicity. So what lands up happening is if it is a one, it's basically providing a pulse width uh, a, a pulse that's enabling this uh, particular row, row one. And let's say row N also has a one, and let's say all others are zeros. So what it ends up doing, it basically concurrently reads more than one memory cell. And the bit line is now a, a function of the state of more than one cell at a time. And you could essentially think about this as a dot product of wi into the cell into wn into the cell and the magnitude of discharge that you are going to see in the bit line is going to correspond to how many of these cells were discharging at any given point of time and that is kind of the very basic primitive of what this analog pim is doing and of course i make it look very simple uh, there are a lot of different techniques that you can use. So instead of a binary uh, word line, you can do things like amplitude mod modulation of the word line or the width modulation of the word line to be able to support multiple bits. That way it's basically uh, affecting the amount of discharge time each one is participating by modulating the word line. And of course, the sensitivity of the sense amplifiers to be able to read out all these values become uh, important uh, aspect of it. So if you look at uh, some of the, the more recent TSMC uh, work in this case, uh, it, it basically has a lot more circuits and modifications to even the uh, analog to digital converter to be able to provide the required precision for doing this uh, analog uh, PIM. And I do refer you to some of this references five and seven for an even more detailed uh, viewpoint. But there is reluctance uh, in a traditional processor company like uh, Intel to be able to incorporate too much of analog computation in an otherwise more digital uh, processor. So uh, the jury is mixed on uh, some of these analog designs. And the design that you sh uh, I showed you based on lookup table was primarily driven by the notion don't necessarily rely too much on analog because scaling becomes a challenge in these type of designs. 
Okay, thank you very much for uh, elaborating on this. And just to complement this question, uh, do, do you believe that uh, multi-bit uh, analog uh, processing in memory is a viable option or uh, is limited to some very niche applications? So, um, <laughs> again, predicting the future is really hard, right? So, um, so far there has been a reluctance in using uh, analog designs outside niche applications. And, uh, uh, again, what I attribute as niche applications, when you start embedding some of these computes in traditionally digital designs, right? And uh, many of these uh, things that we typically think as RF or analog also have a lot of digital components. And in fact, many of them have been moving into the uh, digital side of things for dealing with things. So uh, however, uh, analog type compute may have its sweet spots in niche applications, maybe in IoT applications and uh, other designs where you know the uh, uh, margins, you probably need to do low bit uh, precision. Uh, uh, I think that's the space where analog seems pretty competitive right now. But again, uh, it remains to be seen uh, where it goes. Right now, uh, the wind is blowing more towards the digital preference. Uh, uh, analog, however, is attractive in these low bit configurations. But things can change as more of these multi level cells start becoming available uh, in uh, some of these emerging technologies. Uh, then the ability to represent and do computations in a higher radix may probably make this uh, and move this from a niche to a more general purpose computing. But uh, that we need to wait and see where things go. But right now, I think your uh, question, which provides the answer, uh, uh, is probably true. It's probably good for uh, niche applications and low bit with applications. Thank you. Thank you for sharing sharing your thoughts on the, on this future. <laughs> uh, there is another question from uh, Sergio Bampi. Um, um, the question is, yeah, thank you for highlighting. Uh, is the BC memory architecture for processing in memory for of uh, Max, uh, is a patent by your group? So uh, Sergio, uh, nice meeting you virtually. Hope things are good in Brazil. Uh, um, uh, it is a patent that Intel holds, uh, uh, not me. So uh, it, it was work done when I was working with Intel. Uh, so uh, Intel has a patent on it. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, Ricardo, if you have any questions, just feel free to activate your microphone. You're muted, uh, Ricardo. No, uh, Ricardo, we cannot hear you. Uh, so, yes. Uh, so as you can see the question, I would like uh, to see if uh, BJ can do some comments about uh, the power consumption of this approach. So uh, one of the fundamental drivers uh, 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 for uh, this, so uh, let me actually use this uh, slide as an example. The primary motivation of this is to travel less, right? So uh, 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 Ricardo and Sergio, maybe you both feel that we all should have been in France, but remember the amount of time that we saved and the amount of fuel that we saved, right? Not being physically in Bordeaux. That's kind of the same notion uh, uh, out here. Uh, it's basically I'm giving my lecture from Pennsylvania avoided all that extra energy over of transporting myself and the time to transport. So yes, the time part is there. It's also the energy part. And the same is true in this particular design. When we start incorporating these computes within the subarray using our BCE approach, we avoided traversing through all these interconnects within the SRAM to go down there. And uh, you can actually see one of these uh, results that I actually showed you are actually, uh, maybe I removed this 
part, there is a commensurate energy benefit. So in this particular case, you can see a 3x energy efficiency. And this 3x is compared to uh, uh, another cash accelerator. So uh, the magnitude is much larger when you compare it to a traditional cash with no in-cash computing. So uh, that's the energy save. And where should uh, uh, the compute be done? SRAM, DRAM, SSD. Based on that, the energy efficiency or energy gains would be even higher. So uh, hopefully that gives you some quantification for the numbers that you were looking for, Ricard. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much for your answers. And um, I think uh, we'll need to conclude this um, this talk and this uh, this week. Um, so thank you very much, Vijay, for uh, the great talk, and uh, thank you for uh, the questions. Um, so and, and, uh, thank you very much. And uh, uh, one thing that I typically do at the beginning of the talk, but uh, uh, many of this great work was done by uh, my students, uh, my collaborators, not only at Penn State. Uh, at multiple universities, I remain thankful to them. Uh, however, any shortcomings of the presentation, it's just mine, not because of the wonderful work they uh, uh, land up doing. Uh, and uh, uh, finally, I thank uh, the students listening into this uh, 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 lecture and their advisors uh, who have also joined them. Uh, if you have any questions or if you just listen to this talk, please send me a note. That's the greatest pleasure that I have, especially if I uh, get a note from one of the students. And if uh, in any way I could help uh, uh, provide insights to your own research that relates to this, I'm happy to do free consulting with no expectations in return. Because if you succeed, uh, I succeed. So that, that's the philosophy that I work with. So thanks again for this opportunity to connect to this uh, community and maybe of uh, more help in future to any of them. So my email is vijay at csc.psu.edu or you can Google me or Bing me. Uh, you would be able to find me. Uh, thanks again, Antoine. This is a great opportunity. I appreciate it. Thanks, Ricardo. Thank, Thank you very you. much. We would have loved um, to have you physically to also share uh, the gala dinner tonight, uh, but hoping that we'll have a, a chance in the future to. Uh, to, uh, to enjoy uh, being physically together. Um, so thank you very much. And uh, I would like uh, to also to, to thank you, Vijay, for the nice talk and to accept uh, being part of this uh, third edition of this IEEE CAS Seasonal School on uh, Sequence System for IoT. I also do like uh, to thank a lot uh, to the organization of this school by Francois Rivet by Antoine uh, Frappe and Guillaume uh, Perret and uh, all other students of the B branch is one of the most active uh, student branch of uh, IEEE that I know. And um, so uh, I hope that um, soon uh, it will be possible to announce a fourth edition of this uh, season school. And I also like to thank all of you on behalf of the IEEE Secrets and Systems Society, uh, uh, special interest group on IoT. And I also would like to use this opportunity to invite you to attend also some nice talks next week on the 11 uh, IEEE CAS Rio Grande do Sul workshop, virtual one from Porto Alegre, but with speakers from many locations around the world. So you can go to the web page that I put here on the, on the chat. Uh, to see the program and uh, to do your registration that is always that is also a free registration and uh, next Friday afternoon in Brazil is the third uh, IEEE CAS uh, Young Professionals Workshop also talking uh, so um, thank you all and I I give the floor back to Antoine to Okay, many thanks, uh, Ricardo. And uh, so I wish you a nice day, evening, or morning for some of them. And uh, wish you the best. Keep safe and uh, uh, 
hopefully we'll see each other in the future in the near future bye bye thank you all bye 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 bye, -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. thanks